In this video I'm going to do a destructive test to see how well my thatching technique was when I was laying the water reed. G'day, my name is Stuart Chignall. Welcome to uh, Chestnut and Ag. And in previous videos I've said, explained how um, uh, this has to come down. And on the last one I was taught, we was on the rush and how it fared. Now it's the reed's turn. Uh, and I, I laid this with a different technique, a different technique particularly for the valley. And I'm going to be very interested to see how the different material and the different technique has made a difference. I've taken uh, a, a few sheaths off, uh, one of the top layers off, and already <laughs> seeing a problem. This is partly because this area here didn't get finished properly, but you can already see how damp this is. And um, if we look at, see how, how it's breaking up, it's quite, it's deteriorating quite a lot already, and this is actually, this hasn't been up there for very long. Oh, year and a half maybe? No, less. This would be a year. Because I would have harvested this last winter, I think. But it's, um, yeah, not not good. Uh, so we'll see what it's like as we go down. Um, but I think the conclusion is going to be pretty similar to what I found with the, with the other side where I used the rush. And that is that my technique for thatching a valley isn't up for the job. Let's see what it's like on the um, on the gable. So uh, it should be much easier to get right. See what the conditions like. Okay, I've just started working on uh, the the gable and the next layer. And uh, again, I've come across a similar issue that we had with the rush. If you see here, this this wet patch right in the middle, and it seems to be associated with a drip point off the branch up there because it's dry all around, but just that point is is damp. And if you look over here where it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be perfectly dry and there's nothing around there other than, there's nothing around there that would indicate where the water was coming, it's not coming from up further up the roof or anything, it just seems to be coming down from the, tr the branch above. Now, one of the persistent problems I had when I was laying the both the rush and the reed was getting it tight enough and <laughs> it seemed to be a lot easier with the reed because it wasn't as compressible. But now that we're taking it down, have a look at this. This is stuff I was able to get really tight, but it's loosened. And I'm not sure if this is because this rope has stretched uh, and given it some um, room to move, or whether it's the reed or it's shifted or I didn't get it tight enough. But whatever the reason is that it was causing slippage. And as it loosened, the, the, the rush was sort of slipping down. Now, as I added more layers, the layers that I put on top seemed to mostly kind of hold the lower levels in place, even when they wasn't as tight as I would like, but still not optimum. And so I think I'm going to have to work out whether it was the rope that was no good or whether it was my technique. I think in the early days it was technique. But in the later days, as I got higher, my technique of getting it tighter improved. So I think it's the rope. And so if I'm going to do this ever again, I'm going to have to find a material different from this rope because it's just, I think it's prone to stretching. Well, we're now well and truly into the, the gutter and found some interesting stuff. Uh, when I laid it, laid the reed, what I did was I laid the flat sections here and there on the gables and then tried to blend the gutter in and so that's allowed me to take off the reed on the outside on the gables and that's left us with the gutter in place and there are signs that moisture has been getting in you can see this the dirt in there and that's um, mildew but it has fared a lot better than the rush I think because the reed is less absorbent it doesn't hold as much water and it dries out faster. So it seems that this this stuff is still, well, it's not great structural integrity, but it, it's not rotted. It's just maybe a little brittle here in the gutter. So I still think it wouldn't have lasted the full 20 years, but um, maybe it would have lasted 10. Hard to say. But anyway, it's almost all down. Uh, last stretch now. Well, some time has passed. Uh, not only is the reed all off the roof, but the frame is all gone as well. I've even started setting up the workshop back in the shade here of the Morton Bay Fig. 
Um, makes for some interesting dappled light conditions. Uh, if you remember some of the early videos I've done, made, made filming a little tricky, but say la vie, until I can work out some sort of other arrangement, this is what we're gonna have to deal with. But some more observations about the Reed and some comparisons with the Rush. Now, one of my theories was that Reed, uh, or if you're in the UK, you would know it as uh, Norfolk Reed. It's a Phragmites species. It's found pretty much all over the world, either naturally or it's been introduced, uh, is the premium thatching material in the modern era. And one of the theories I had behind that was not only was it you know, a good material, but also was that it was it's easy to machine harvest, whereas other materials might be just as good, but because they have to be harvested by hand, they weren't used in a modern context. It was one of the very keen re reasons I wanted to use the rush. The rush is much more difficult to harvest. Something that isn't a surprise, um, now that I know a bit more about both, is that the reed is just a superior, to, superior material. Uh, it's easy to harvest whether you're doing it by hand or by um, machine. <laughs> but it's also very easy to lay. The rush takes a lot more effort to get it neat and clean, and it takes it's much harder to shape when you're forming the roof and forming the fall of the roof. It's much harder to tie um, because it's so spongy. It's very difficult to get the 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 ropes tight enough to hold it. And, and even though this was still a problem with the reed, it was a much bigger problem, the rush. The second thing is that the reed is much more durable. And this isn't because the material is less prone to rot, but it's more to do with the structure. Something I haven't really talked about on this channel, some of the, um, the, the technicalities about how rot forms, but basically all plant materials, you know, within, no, all plant materials, full stop, are prone to rot if they are damp. And because the rush is so absorbent, it tends to absorb moisture and hold it, which means it's much more likely to be in, have a moisture content at which it will rot than another material like reed, which isn't really absorbent at all. It's very, it sheds water very easily. It's lucky there, saying hello to the neighbors, just checking them out over the fence. <laughs> but I don't think they're up yet. Um, and so because the reed, uh, doesn't get wet, doesn't hold moisture, dries out faster, it's much less likely to rot than the rush. And so that means it, it's, a, it's a brilliant, that's for, so for neatness of laying, ease of harvest and durability, it makes it a superior material. The exception though, is it doesn't bend at all. So even in a modern context, rush is still used to a degree um, for things like the, uh, the ridges and the cappings to sort of bring, when the two roofs come together, they'll fold rush over the top because it's very well, flexible. Um, that's one of the reasons why the, 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 the ridges of thatch roofs have to be replaced more frequently than the rest of the thatch is because they're often made out of a material that is less durable than you know, the reed which forms the main roof. Um, and with the rush, because uh, I didn't know what I was doing, first first thatching I'd ever done, I just basically started laying up one side. And then when it came to trying to blending the, the, the valley, I, well, I, I, did, I did a rubbish job. Um, and because I had basically one side done, then I was trying to get the other side to sort of feed onto it and so that the water would then shed off. But that meant that you had a lot of water dumping into one spot and you saw from the rush video, it just, it didn't go well at all. With the reed, uh, I did the extreme gables, did a strip up each side of, of the gables. And then I tried to blend the material. Lucky. <laughs> Look at this, this is my neighbor saying hello to my dog. Lucky's a bit taller than Tom. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> where was I? Um, oh yeah. So with the reed, what I did was I got a bundle coming in this way and then a bundle coming in this way. And then I did a, a sort of a stagger. And the idea was that the water would flow off one side and then flow off the other side and then flow off the other side and sort of kind of zigzag its way down. Um, yeah, that didn't work very well. 
And I've, from further research I've done since I laid that, um, laying the valleys is a, is a skill in itself. And because it's tricky, it seems to be that a traditional technique is to not do it, to actually put some other material in the valley to form um, to actually form the valley itself. So the rush, you're not relying on the rush to take all the water from the two sides, two sides of a roof coming together. You use a different material. That's not to say that thatched valleys don't exist, they do, but it seems to be a lot of effort put in to make the angle at which the valleys come together as shallow as possible and to really, really blend it so you've got a, a, a more curved shape to the valley rather than the kind of these steeper angles, which is what I was doing, which in hindsight makes a lot of sense. To wrap this experiment up, what I would say is that if you are going to have a crack at thatching your own roof, make sure the roof that you are thatching uh, is flat, doesn't have any valleys, because that makes it considerably harder. Um, and if I'm doing it again in the future, maybe some uh, maybe if I was doing a small building and, and maybe I was crazy and it had a dormer window or something, then I would use the traditional cheat and have a, uh, another material in the valley just because it makes it so much easier. But I, I'd do everything I could if I was going to do a thatch roof to just have it a straight flat roof because even with a basic amount of practice, I reckon you can do that and I know I can do that. So yeah, that concludes the rush experiment. Well, at least my, that includes my first rush experiment. Coming up on this channel, I'm going to be taking this bad boy and turning it into a Japanese riving brake. Yeah, it's been a project I've had on my mind for some time. And since the councillor said I've got to get rid of scrap wood, and because this is an off cut <laughs> from a beam, it's scrap wood, um, if I turn it into a tool then I can keep it and that was the plan was to turn it into a tool so if I get that done I don't have to get rid of it so stay tuned for that video and I'll catch you guys soon